Those of you who have heard of Pol Pot know him as the monstrous communist dictator of Cambodia that was responsible for the deaths of millions of his own people. Well in this video, I plan on telling you the tale of this man's journey. But before doing that, you need to know of two major long-term events that occurred while he lived. The first is French colonialism. The Industrial Revolution began in Britain in the 18th century and spread to the rest of Western Europe, the US, and Japan. One aspect of industrialization was improved weaponry. This was one reason why many industrialized countries invaded other areas of the world and successfully stole their resources. One of these areas was Vietnam, which at the time was colonized by the French. Eventually, forces within Vietnam fought to obtain freedom. The second long-term event was the Cold War. This was a war fought between the US and the USSR. Really, it was a battle of two ideologies, capitalism versus communism. These two countries never really fought each other directly, since that would lead to nuclear war and ultimately human extinction. Instead, they fought proxy wars all over the world. These were often civil wars within different countries in which the US took one side and Russia and sometimes China teamed up with the other side. Several examples include the Korean War, the Soviet Afghanistan War, and the Yom Kippur War. The Vietnam War was another one of these proxy wars. Now let's move on to the man himself, Pol Pot. In a small village of Prek Sabao, a child by the name of Saloth Sar was born. His family was quite wealthy. His father was a rice farmer with around 10 times the amount of land as the national average. At the ripe age of nine, he was sent to the capital, Phnom Penh, where he spent a year at a Buddhist monastery. Afterwards, he attended a French monastery. He continued his education in Cambodia until the age of 24, when he obtained a scholarship from a university in Paris. Here he studied radio technology, and it was also here that he started spending time in communist circles. He eventually returned back to his homeland in January of 1953. At this time, the country was rebelling against French colonial rule. By the end of the year, Cambodia had gained its independence. Soon after, he joined a communist political party in Cambodia, named the Khmer's People's Revolutionary Party. This party was birthed in 1951, with the help of communist North Vietnam. From 1956 to 1963, he had a job at a private school where he taught French literature, history, and geography. Eventually, the government started targeting communist activity, so he and other leaders of the party hid in the countryside of North Cambodia, along with North Vietnamese soldiers, also known as Viet Cong. In 1968, Salath Sar became the party chief, and he formed the Khmer Rouge. This was a guerrilla army that supported the ideology of the party. Khmer is the name of the language spoken in Cambodia, and it's also the name of the main ethnicity in Cambodia. Rouge is a color very similar to red. They gained a strong foothold in northeastern Cambodia. In 1970, while Cambodia's leader, Prince Norodom Sahanouk, was out of the country, a Cambodian general, Lon Nol, attempted to stage a military coup with the aid of the United States. When the prince returned, he sided with the Khmer Rouge to take back power. A bloody civil war broke out. While these two sides fought, the Vietnam War was going on. The Vietnam War was going on, and the U.S. had teamed up with South Vietnam and had sent around 70,000 troops into Cambodia to fight the Viet Cong who had hidden there. Both sides committed atrocities in this war. The use of child soldiers was common. It's estimated that around 300,000 people perished because of this civil war. While a civil war was underway in Cambodia, the U.S. was engaged in the Vietnam War, and U.S. President Richard Nixon began a bombing campaign. Over the course of four years, the U.S. dropped around half a million tons of bombs on Cambodia. The number of casualties is unknown, but many experts estimate that around 100,000 people died from these bombings. Not only that, but U.S. troops occupied parts of Cambodia shortly after this. Nixon claimed that the bombing and occupation was done so South Vietnamese allies could leave safely out of Cambodia. Many Cambodians were upset with their government's reaction to this, and they rebelled and overthrew it. The Khmer Rouge replaced them. By the end of Nixon's bombing campaign in 1973, the Khmer Rouge nearly tripled in size. They had captured close to three-fourths of Cambodia. Eventually, the communist Khmer Rouge officially seized the reins of Cambodia. Shortly after coming into power, the city of Phnom Penh 
which had a population of around 2.5 million people, was evacuated. As usual in communist revolutions, specialists in different fields, such as doctors and teachers, were stripped of their jobs and possessions and sent to re-education camps. Those who complained about the work were tortured and killed. Those who concealed their rations were tortured and killed. Those who broke rules were tortured and killed. The torturing and killing often occurred in detention centers. Perhaps the most infamous of these centers was at Security Prison 21, nicknamed S-21. Estimates conclude that the number of people killed there was around 12,000 to 20,000. The torturers, guards, and prison staff is estimated to be around 1,500. They were often aged between 15 and 19. Another interesting feature of this prison was that the teenagers that ran it were forbidden from addressing their parents as mother and father. This was because the nation of Cambodia itself was the only true parent anyone could have. The bones of millions of Cambodians were buried in mass graves, which were often called killing fields. It was often middle class and intellectuals that were tortured. This includes many doctors, lawyers, and students. On top of that, private property, money, and religion were all abolished. The term torture can mean many things. So here are some of the following methods of torture used by the Khmer Rouge. Beating with fists, feet, or electric wire, burning with cigarettes, electric shocks, waterboarding, suffocation with plastic bags, being forced to eat feces, and being covered with angry scorpions. Here is a following excerpt from Dith Pran, a survivor of Pol Pot's reign. I see a pile of skulls and bones. For the first time since my arrival, what I see before me is too painful, and I break down completely. These are my relatives, my friends, my neighbors. It is estimated between 1975 and 1979 that the Khmer Rouge, led by Pol Pot, killed around 1.7 million Cambodians, close to one-fifth of the country's population. Throughout the 1980s, the Khmer Rouge received arms from China and support from the U.S. The Khmer Rouge lost power throughout the 90s. In 1997, Pol Pot was caught by a Khmer Rouge splinter group. They kept him under house arrest for a year, and at the age of 72, Pol Pot died from a heart attack. So what is the legacy of Pol Pot's regime in Cambodia now? According to Cambodian historian David Chandler, nearly half the population is under the age of 24. And because so many people within the country had no direct experience with the conflict, the nation has been slowly overcoming the trauma. The Khmer Rouge was succeeded by the Communist Cambodians People Party. This party takes credit for giving Cambodia its second birth after the horrors of the Khmer Rouge. Many people went in the opposite direction of the Khmer Rouge's ideas, rules, and philosophies. Here are some final thoughts and questions for you guys. Why was it that young people ran the infamous S21 prison? I noticed that when it came to Mao Zedong's cultural revolution, the Red Guard also was made up mostly of young people. Young people in general tend to be more rebellious. Was it the lack of economic opportunities that led these young people to join these causes? Was it poverty that led them to seek some sort of messianic figure and cause that could save them? Perhaps the people of Cambodia actually believe the Khmer Rouge could somehow make the country better off. Another question is, what was the rest of the world doing? Should they have been doing something? After all, French colonialism, the US and the Soviets' involvement in the Cambodian Civil War, and Nixon's bombing campaign are all examples of global superpowers laying the groundwork for these atrocities. I noticed something interesting while reading up on Pol Pot. Perhaps one key trait that I see amongst many horrible figures throughout history was the callousness towards the loss of human life. Pol Pot famously said, better to kill an innocent by mistake than spare an enemy by mistake. This quote, in my opinion, displays how insensitive he was towards the loss of innocent life. Contrast this with what Ben Franklin famously said, it is better 100 guilty persons should escape than that one innocent person should suffer. That's all for this video. If you liked it, please consider donating to my Patreon or PayPal so I can make more of them. Thanks for watching and I'll see you later.